Well, hello, everyone. It is my privilege to introduce our panel, The Role of Parent Power and Permissionless Education. Because without parents, we wouldn't have the children, and we wouldn't have the education that our children need. Um, you know, there are vast differences in states that truly give parents power and allow them to choose the education environments that are best for their children. We can see those differences in outcomes and children well-being. We can see it across the country. Yet we hear platitudes. Those platitudes are the parents are the first teacher. We want parents to come out and be engaged. But there are very few systems across this country that really elevate parent power. So that's what we're going to talk about today. As you know, I'm Pat Brantley. I am the proud CEO of Friendship Public Charter School, where we educate 5,000 children and support their families in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. And so parents mean a lot to me because they are what made our schools possible over 25 years ago. But we were told when we went to start those schools that families didn't want choice. They didn't want options. They didn't need us. And on the first day when we opened with 1,200 families, there were 1,000 more who sat on our waiting list that didn't have a chance. So I want to start with Brenea Fairchild, the founder of Melanin Village. Brenea has been an educator, managed operations for a charter management organization, founded a tutoring company, and now is making homeschool possible for families across the nation. Brenea, what does parent power mean to you? That's a great question. So, so glad to be here. Um, I think exactly what you said. When you think about the platitudes, parents are, uh, you know, children's first teachers. Parent power really means treating parents as if that's true, right? Coming alongside parents as partners and experts who know things about their children, uh, about their children's experiences and likes and dislikes and what works for them um, that in a typical maybe education setting, you wouldn't be able to see or know or be privy to as a classroom teacher. So it really is that idea of how can we take parents and say, hey, you have wisdom, you have knowledge that I don't have, and I want to be able to be able to uh, involve that, right, wrap that into your child's learning experience. And so one of the ways that we do that in the village is I always say we both empower and equip parents with the, uh, with the tools so that they can provide a world-class education at home, right? Because I think parents, this narrative of like, you know, parents have to go to the teachers for permission is where our society is right now. And so we're empowering parents to be like, no, you can do this. You really are. My favorite phrase is, you're uniquely equipped to homeschool your child. You are uniquely equipped to educate your child. And it's not my bias, it's research, right? Research looks at the impact of student-teacher relationships and how they impact academic achievement and academic outcomes. And there's no relationship that's more powerful than the one that a child has with their parents, right? And so how can we look at parents as those partners that have that, that kind of that wisdom, that key to success in their, child, their children's lives? and wrap them in that way. And I will say, you see a very big difference between states that are empowering parents to do this and those that are not. So the Melanin Village is a national organization. So we serve families um, where state, uh, school choice is you know, um, universal in places like Arizona and then other places where it's not, um, like in New Jersey or in North Carolina. And we see the difference in, in terms of parent frustration and parent engagement and what they feel like they can and cannot do when there's that access to choice. So it's really treating parents as if they are those partners partners um, in our, those fountains of wisdom about the children. Thank you, Brenea. Colleen Dipple, Families Empowered. So first, Colleen, I love your organization. I love this idea of the work that you do to ensure that parents and guardians have information on what their local school choices are and how they can access them to make the best decisions for their children. And I'm going to have to read this because I've heard you say, it is stunning that community leaders and elected officials are not listening to the people who elected them and to their constituents and offering more choice. Can you say more about that? Why should elected officials listen? And what does true listening look like? Sure, so um, thank you for this question. And I just wanna say I'm really grateful that we're focusing in a very real way on parents because um, parents are the deciders they are the taxpayers, and they know and love their children best. Um, and so we, you know, bet the farm on on parents. And so, one, why should elected officials listen to them? Because, um, you know, 
parents elected them. It's their job, right, to listen to parents. Um, and at Families Empowered, we've served families and helped parents decide, um, will find and then apply to schools or schooling options that are best for their children, and we listen to them without judgment. We believe them. We trust that they are able to make good decisions. And so in my state, uh, I found at Families Empowered in Texas, we do not have universal school choice. Um, yet we're serving hundreds of thousands of families who want it. Um, that tension is real, and I think for elected officials who choose to ignore parents um, and to disregard what parents want, I think they will find that they are on the losing end of, at some point, an electoral situation. Um, and they're actually just making, um, they're, they're making a bad bet, right? We, we, can, we can bet on parents. We can trust parents, and we should give parents the high quality individualized schooling options they want. Um, and if elected officials choose not to listen to parents, I just, we cannot put this genie back in the bottle. I predict it will not work out well for elected officials who choose to disregard tax paying parents. Thank you. Uh, David Noah, Comp Sci High. You've been a teacher, a lawyer, um, and now you're the founder of a school that's in the top 2% of New York State, which is completely impressive. So I have to ask, um, is parental choice really important to having great schools? What do you say to the people that say, listen, the professional educators know best and parents need to step back and let them deliver good schools? It's a, it's a great question, Pat. I think the first thing I'd say to those people is, where do you work? Because I doubt you run a good school. Um, but, um, so I'll say three things about that. I think the first is, like, when we started our school, um, the first thing we did before we opened our doors was actually parent focus groups and student focus groups in the community. Because, like, yes, of course, I'm a professional educator and I have lots of ideas about what works, but the truth of the matter is, like, who do schools serve, right? I mean, we just heard from Benet, we just heard from Colleen, like, who do schools serve? They serve the kids and the families. And so you have to start there. And then, and then move on. So yes, Kamsa High, is a, it, it, our mission is focused on economic freedom, but why? Because we are in a community that doesn't have it. And so that, is, that, is the, that was the first inspiration for our mission as a school. So that's the first thing is like, where do you work? Probably not a great school. Second thing I'd say to those, um, those people who said, well, does parent power really matter? Um, like I'd say, see what happens if you ignore parents. I think when people say, well, parents are very disengaged at my school, I'd say, well, wouldn't you be disengaged if you were trying to talk to someone for 10 years and they weren't listening? Like, of course you'd be disengaged um, because you'd, you'd, you'd understand the energy you were getting, but like, go ahead and ask a parent's advice and watch how quickly that relationship changes. My favorite advice to give to teachers and school leaders is like, they're like, well, what do I do with this parent? I said, ask their advice. If you wanna know what to do with a parent, ask their advice and really listen, um, and you will learn a lot about the kid, you will learn a lot about how our school could be better, um, and you will learn a lot about how you could do your job better. And so um, I think the third thing is like, if schools are not divorced from their communities. And so if you wanna understand the community you're in, even if you yourself are from that community, you have to understand the texture and the entire community you serve. And that means getting out and talking to children and families um, so you understand the homes that the children are coming from that you are serving, so you understand what it means to serve them. And if you haven't done those things, then you're not actually educating your students is what I would say. Thank you. And Joe Connor, founder of Odyssey. I love both the idea and the reality of Odyssey, a company that's at the intersection of education, government, and technology, and really using that to empower families. So how are you helping families to have power? Yeah, great question. Um, the way that we do it is Odyssey helps states easily manage and administer school choice programs. And our major focus is on making the programs accessible for parents. 
So typically when school choice programs pass, there's two phases of them, right? There's a legislative part. We work solely on the second part, which is implementation. And I think a big part of uh, realizing the full promise of school choice programs is making sure that they're implemented in a way that is very easy for parents to use. And so when I started the company three years ago, there were only four ESAs at the time. One of them was actually held up in court, so there were only really three. And the very first thing that I did was spend six months uh, traveling to places like Arizona, to Florida, and actually talking to parents there and saying, hey, you know, you're on this program, tell me what's good about it, what doesn't work? And we quickly identified that there was a major blocking point for parents being able to quickly sign up, get approved, and access funds. And so one of the things that we rolled out for the first time in the country at Odyssey was real-time digital identity verification. And so in Iowa, where we currently administer the Students First ESA program, over 30,000 parents applied for the program, and they were all able to find out their um, determination, whether or not they're approved for the program, very quickly. In most cases, under one second. And so that means that we're really beating kind of what to date has been a very slow industry standard of about 30, 60, in some cases 90 days, and making sure that these parents are able to easily access them and use them. Because I think these programs are really only as good as how popular they are with parents and how easy they are to sign up. And so a lot of what we spend our time doing, and I think it actually dovetails a lot with everyone else in this panel, is making sure that these programs are very simple and easy for parents to sign up. And I can't really emphasize how important that is uh, to these programs in every state uh, nationwide. Thank you. You know, I often think about the work that we do with parents, and it's one individual parent, and we talk to them about using their voice with their school. But then we hear stories about tens of thousands of families that are sitting on waiting lists that can't get their choice. And so I, I'd love your advice, whether it's for the individual or the collective, but what is your advice to parents about building and leveraging their power? And why don't we start with you, Vernea? I really appreciate this question um, because even as I said in the village, you know, we empower and equip parents. Um, the word empower isn't necessarily the best one um, because you already have the power, right? Like it's not like I need to give it to you, which is what empowerment suggests. Like you have the power, you are the taxpayer, you are the voter, right? Um, you are the one who decides what your child does and where they are and where they go. Like you already have the power. Um, and so I think it's sometimes just kind of inspiring people to um, activate their power um, and there being advocates like us that are saying, hey, you know, the school isn't doing what you need them to do or this teacher doesn't seem to be a good fit or isn't listening. Okay, you can, you can elevate that concern. You can write to this person. You can do that thing. And so um, first, I'd say just to all of us um, and those that are watching that anytime you hear a parent that might be um, struggling or if you yourself are a parent struggling, just uh, look, for, look for allies. Look for others that would say, hey, I hear you. I believe you and let's work with what you're saying um, versus trying to convince you what's going on with your with your baby isn't really going on. So um, that's number one. And then secondly, I would say something that just through this experience and so many conversations I've been having is like, don't be afraid uh, for it to be a little bit messy. Um, I think sometimes when we need to get what we need, uh, our voices might have to raise, right? Uh, we might have to ask <laughs> a little bit louder and sometimes that feels uncomfortable. Um, but being willing to, um, to, to show up at the meetings, um, um, to, to vote in a way that makes sense, uh, that advocates for what your family needs. Um, I think I would also empower parents to do that. Those are things we could start doing today uh, to make a difference. Thank you. Colleen? So I, I think that this is a really good question because when I first founded Families Empowered, we had thought we were going to create this advocacy organization. And um, actually Howard Fuller, who is a, a real like mentor and someone I deeply respect, looked at me and he said, well, it's really great that you want to organize parents, but have you asked them what they want? And literally, it was like a, like a, a bulb went off, right? Because again, getting back to your earlier question, and I, I will answer this, but we, there's no other business or industry that ignores the consumer except this one, right? So we need to listen to parents, and then we need to make it very easy for parents' voices to be heard in a way that respects 
where they are, and what is happening for them. So at Families Empowered, we are trying to elevate parent voices. We haven't done it very, very well, but we're excited. We're gonna use some of our YAS Prize to, to do that. Um, and for some families, I mean, we, this fall, had a very important vote. We did pass-through calls, which we've never done before. We just stood it up through our call center, and we called parents and said, hey, would you like $8,000 to spend on your kid? And they said, yeah. We said, would you please tell your legislator, we can pass you through today. That's C3 permissible. We used our infrastructure to do that, and it didn't require taking days off work and marching. So I think really recognizing how important parents are, but then figuring out ways to meet them where they are so they can be engaged is very, very important. And it's a different way of looking at parents. Thank you. David? Yeah, I'll, I'll just double down on what Colleen said. I think, and, and as a school, I think we have an obligation, like the advice to parents is turn up, simply like turn up the heat on legislators, but on legislators, but like that's, that's not always aligned to like what they have time for, what they're interested in doing. And so I think we have an obligation as schools to actually turn up the heat on ourselves by giving parents easier access, lowering the barriers to entry and saying like, hey, come to the school this morning, grab breakfast, and like, we're gonna make sure that our local politician is there. And you tell them whatever you wanna tell them, including how we need to do better. Um, and if we're willing to do that as schools, then um, I think we can lower the barrier to entry for parents um, in terms of their ability to access and make their voices heard. Thank you. And I would just add, I think that all of that, everything that the panelists have said is great. I would add that really it's about kind of coalition building and people think about that in a very formal way, but it's kind of what all of those groups together can achieve. And so states um, are responsive if enough people do uh, raise their voices. And we've seen that because we've been, you know, in numerous states across the country now. And so talking to people in the governor's office, talking to state reps, uh, state senators, state agencies that might be tasked with carrying it out, um, people do listen to parents. They do listen also to schools. I actually just really want to echo that. That's probably something I wouldn't have known three years ago before I started the company. But the, the fact that schools are kind of speaking for a certain community, right, gives them a power which um, sometimes parents lack. And so actually, the most successful campaigns that we've seen really include both parents as well as schools, school networks, um, and those are kind of the most fruitful. Thank you. So there you have it, America. Parent power is the route to great schools that honor the potential of every child. And so what I'd love to say to any parent that's listening is this. Demand information. Get the data. Raise your voice. Join with others. But always make the decision that is best for your child because you are the only one that can. Thank you, panelists.